Today on the Perception in Action podcast, a look at perceptual motor development from a traditional perspective. How do we learn to control our bodies as we grow? What is the relative importance of genetics and early experience? So it's time for a call to action. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Today's episode will be the first of a two-part mini-series on perceptual motor development. In this episode, I will focus on traditional theories, while in the second part, which will come out in a few weeks, I will look at the alternative view provided by the ecological approach. For our primer about the basic differences between traditional and ecological theories in this area, I refer you to episode 20C, where I go through some examples of how they differ. But let's now turn to the topic of development. If you are a parent yourself, or have spent any amount of time around infants, you will quickly realize that the development of new perceptual motor skills, whether it's rolling over, crawling, reaching, or walking, are the most dramatic and observable changes in an infant's first year of life. I have two kids myself, and I remember how everything changed in our house when they became mobile, seemingly overnight. Before we dive into research on this topic, a couple important points about terminology. Throughout the episode, I'm going to use the term motor development in places where I really mean perceptual motor development. As I've tried to emphasize throughout the podcast, perception and action need to be considered together. So how do we define the term perceptual motor development? For the traditional approach I'm talking about today, I like this one from Clark and Whittall. Quote, motor development is a sequential, continuous, age-related process whereby an individual progresses from simple, unorganized, and unskilled movement to the achievement of highly organized, complex motor skills, and finally to the adjustment of skills that accompanies aging. The study of perceptual motor development in infants really began in earnest in the 1920s with the work of people like Arnold Gessel and Myrtle McGraw. They spent hours meticulously observing and categorizing infant behaviors. Early researchers such as these typically had strong naturistic beliefs and that they saw the developmental changes they were observing as being directly related to the genetically driven processes of brain development. In other words, they believed child development occurred according to a predetermined, naturally unfolding biological plan for growth. The infant's environment and their experience played a minor secondary role in this process, and there was very little consideration for potential individual differences between kids. This view could be seen by the fact that researchers of this era typically used the term growth as synonymous with development. The culmination of this work was a description of the major motor milestones and stages children pass through, typical age norms, and a set of developmental tests that were widely adopted at the time. An example of this were the so-called Gessel Developmental Schedules, first released in 1925. These provided developmental ages for various motor skills, for example, rolling from back to stomach and taking the first few steps. This allowed for calculation of the developmental quotient, a kind of motor equivalent of IQ. DQ is the developmental age for a particular milestone divided by the chronological age at which your child actually reaches this milestone. The developmental ages were derived by taking the normative values for a large sample of children. To foreshadow, although we've now strongly changed our view on the relative importance of genetics and experience, Gessel and other researchers of this time should be commended for pioneering methods for the careful and scientific study of child development. Gessel also proposed some important theoretical principles of motor development. Two of the particularly influential ones focused on why development seems to be inconsistent at times rather than following a simple smooth progression. For example, his principle of reciprocal interweaving captured the observation that development often involves two opposing tendencies. For example, the use of the right or left hand or antagonistic muscles, gradually reaching a balance. He also recognized that asymmetry in development 
For example, an infant always looking to one particular side can be functional. Along with providing the handbook for a generation of fretful and worrying parents, the work of Gessel and the like had another negative consequence on the field of child development. It essentially sewed it up too tight. Most assumed that the major questions related to motor development had all been answered, and researchers turned to other topics like cognitive development. Over the next several years, research in this area tended to be very product-oriented. That is, it focused on more precise description of each developmental milestone that a child needed to reach, for example through more detailed biomechanical analyses. There was very little interest in understanding the underlying processes of skill development because they were thought to simply be directly linked to biological maturation. In the 1960s, the view of perceptual motor development was forever changed as a result of some experiments demonstrating the importance of early visual experience. Warning, depending on your beliefs about animal research, and in particular research on cats, these experiments are a bit gruesome. After conducting pioneer work investigating the response of neurons in the visual cortex of an adult cat, in 1963, David Hubel and Tornsten Weasel sought to examine the effect of the animal's early experience on brain organization. Was it the case that development was purely a genetic maturation process, or did the environment also play a factor? To address this, they took one-month-old kittens and sutured one of their eyes shut before it had a chance to open. They were then reared in this monocular condition for three months. What was found? Within the areas of the brain that responded to the unsutured eye, development of neurons was completely normal. While within the areas for the sutured eye, active cell responses were either non-existent or very weak. In total, in the area of the brain that should normally be dominated by cells responded to the covered eye, only one out of 84 tested did so. This had a profound effect on the animal's motor control. When the covered eye was unsutured and the other eye, which had been open for the first three month period, was covered, the animal moved around as if it was essentially blind. With both eyes open, the animal's behavior was mostly similar to a normal cat, except that its coordination was not as developed. This was most likely due to the lack of binocular coordination between the two eyes, which I talked about way back in episode 5, and we'll discuss a lot more in the episode coming soon. The next important question Hubel and Weasel sought to address was, were these effects of early deprivation of vision in one eye reversible? This has an important implication for some visual disorders that are common in human children, in particular strabismus and amblyopia. In both of these cases, one eye is often weaker than the other during early development, in a way kind of mimicking the suture experiment. What did Hubel and Weasel find in their study? In an attempt to restore visual function to the eye that was deprived, they tried having the animal go through extended periods in which the good, non-sutured eye was covered and the animal was essentially forced to use the bad one, unsutured. Note, this is also often a treatment used with human children for conditions like strabismus. In Hubel and Weasel's experiments, a few weeks of covering the good eye resulted in very little evidence of recovery in the bad one, and the response from the neurons was still highly abnormal. Even if the animal's good eye was covered for over a year, there were only marginal improvements in the deprived one. Through these experiments, Hubel and Weasel provided strong evidence for an important concept in developmental research, the idea of a critical period. A critical period is a period of development during which a particular property, skill, behavior, or brain function develops rapidly and is most sensitive to alterations by the animal's environment and experience. If the function does not develop during this period, for whatever reason, it will either not appear at all or at best be subnormal. Clearly there is a critical period for the normal development of visual cells in the brain for each of our eyes that is sometime within the first few months of life. But are there similar critical periods for motor development? To begin to address this issue, in 1963 Richard Held and Alan Hine 
performed an interesting variation of Hubel and Weasel's experiment. In this study, two groups of 10 kittens were reared in complete darkness from birth to about 12 weeks of age. At that time, they were allowed to explore in a lit environment for three hours a day, but in a very interesting way. During each three hour period, a cat from one of the groups, called the active group, was paired with a cat from the other, called the passive group. Both cats were in a harness that was attached to a carousel. The difference between the two was that the cat in the active group could touch the ground, and it was its movements that caused the carousel to spin. The other cat could not touch the ground and was just moved around passively. So the key here is that both groups had the same visual experience while only one group had active control of what they saw. Or in other words, only one group had perception and action coupled. What was found in this study? Interestingly, when they were tested on purely visual tests, like those you might get when visiting an optometrist office, they were both very similar. For example, both groups had normal smooth pursuit eye movements and pupil reflexes when a light was shone in their eye. However, they were not the same when given more active tests. Cats in the active group could place their paw on a target similar to a normal cat, while those in the passive group were abnormal on this test. Interestingly, cats in the passive group also had abnormal responses to some important action-related visual stimuli. The first was looming. As I discussed back in episode 5, the response to the threat of an approaching object can typically be seen at a very early age. In Held and Hines' experiment, cats in the active group would blink when the experimenter moved their hand towards the cat's face, while those in the passive group did not. Another effect was found when a device called the Visual Cliff was used. This device was developed by Eleanor Gibson, the wife of James Gibson, who I've mentioned many times on this podcast. To foreshadow, we'll be hearing a lot more about Eleanor's excellent work in the second part of this series on development. But anyways, a visual cliff is essentially a table with a four foot deep hole in the middle. The trick is that it's actually covered with a clear sheet of plexiglass so that you can walk all the way across without falling in the hole. In Held and Hines' study, the active cat stopped at the edge of the visual cliff, the hole, just like normal cats do. The passive cats walked right over it and showed an abnormal response to depth. The final question Held and Hines asked was whether or not these effects were irreversible, like those found by Hubel and Weasel. The answer was no. After about 48 hours in which they were given freedom to explore their environment in the light, the visually guided paw placement and response to the visual cliff of the passive cats was now normal. Experiments like these have led many to use a softer term for the role of experience in the development of motor skills, sensitive period. Unlike a critical period, a sensitive period does not have a hard stop and end, and it's possible to still develop normally outside of the period. It's just the case that development of the function in question will likely be faster within the sensitive period. Many of us who have tried to learn a new sport later in life can probably sympathize with this idea. While it's not impossible to become a good tennis player if you first pick up a racket in your mid-40s, your rate of skill acquisition is likely to be much more efficient if you started in your teens or even earlier. So, at this stage in the history of motor development research, the general thinking was that children went through sharp, discrete stages of development that were influenced by the interaction between genetics and their environment. But again, the focus was mostly on the end products of each stage, rather than how the child got there and why each skill developed at the time it did. In other words, the processes. Enter Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget. Piaget's developmental stage theory provided an explanation for why our perceptual motor behaviors develop the way they do, in terms of the cognitive processes and knowledge that was being acquired. Piaget's ideas were heavily based in the information processing approach to perception and action. For example, during the sensory motor stage of Piaget's model, many of the stages the children pass through served the purpose of developing schema, mental representation, and subroutines for action. For more background on these basic topics, I again recommend you listen to episode 21C, 
and also my tribute to Richard Schmidt in episode 18E. In Piaget's view, the primary purpose of development in the first couple years of life was to construct knowledge and understanding of the world by coordinating sensory experiences, for example, what children are seeing or hearing, with physical interactions with objects, for example, grasping and stepping. The key thing that occurred at the end of this initial stage was the ability to develop representations of one's actions, for example, a schema to achieve a particular goal like picking up an object, instead of having to act just reflexively like a newborn infant. So for Piaget, motor development was a means to an end for cognitive development, rather than being important in and of itself. Piaget's work had many important and beneficial implications. In particular, it encouraged parents and schools to provide rich and supportive environments for growth and development. Research more specifically focused on the development of perceptual motor skills really began in earnest in the 1970s. A good review of this work can be found in the paper The Organization of Early Skilled Action by Jerome Bruner, published in 1973. This paper discusses the reworking of one of the key ideas of development, the transition from looking at stages to looking at motor or skill competencies. In this way, the development a child goes through was not so strongly tied to growth, but could rather be just thought of as another type of skill acquisition. The competencies achieved during the first year of life, according to Bruner, were divided into five categories. Feeding, perceiving, manipulating objects, locomoting, and social interaction. Notice the dissociation between a perception and action there. In Bruner's model, the starting point for the development of motor action was a set of pre-adaptive behaviors passed down through evolutionary history. One interesting issue Bruner tackles is how a child learns a complex movement like reaching to pick up an object, even though they initially get no extrinsic knowledge of results feedback. As Bruner describes, this action typically starts with a prolonged period of looking at an object of interest, often followed by mouth movements mimicking what the child will do when they get it in their hands. This is then followed by a series of simple arm movements and fist clenching until eventually a successful reach occurs. But it is not until the very end of the sequence that the child receives any external feedback about the success of the action. So without knowledge of results, how can these different elements what Bruner called subroutines, be put together in the correct way and with the correct parameters. To solve this problem, Bruner appealed to an idea that was popular in motor control research at the time, the efference copy, first proposed by von Holst and Middlestadt in 1950. An efference copy, or what is sometimes called a corollary discharge, is an internal copy of an outward flowing motor command that can be used for a variety of different purposes. One key example is perceptual stability. If I move my eyes to the right, the baseball sitting on my desk in front of me will move leftwards across my retina. This leftwards retinal motion is exactly what would occur if someone actually threw the ball and it was flying by my head. So why don't I perceive the ball as being in motion? Von Holtz and Middlestadt propose that no motion is perceived because at the instant I sent the command to move my eye muscles to the right, an efference copy was generated which essentially cancelled out the retinal motion caused by my own eye motion. Strong support for this came in a very extreme experiment conducted by John Stevens and colleagues. In this study, Stevens paralyzed his eye muscles by injecting them with the poison curare. Oh, what people do in the name of science. When he did this and tried to make an eye movement, all the objects in his visual scene would suddenly appear to jump in the direction of the planned eye movement. Without an actual eye movement, because of the paralysis, he was just seeing the efference copy. Another interesting and somewhat scary effect that occurred was that when he was not able to move his eyes, the entire visual scene began to fade as if he was going blind. But anyways, back to motor development. In Bruner's view, it was this efference copy that allowed a child to put together a sequence of serially ordered subroutines into a complex action like reaching. With each part action, like a small arm movement, a feed-forward efference copy of the intended movement could be compared to the internal signal generated by the actual movement, then corrected. Referring back to Held and Hines' kitten carousel study I talked about a few moments ago, according to Bruner, the reason the kittens in the passive group failed to develop coordinated movements is that they were receiving external feedback 
without first generating an internal efference copy for comparison. Bruner next considered the puzzle of trying to understand how these actions built from a series of simple subroutines seem to be automatically replaced without any practice or feedback by more complex ones. The example he gives is a child suddenly realizing that when holding a toy in each hand, they can pick up a third one if one of them is placed in the crook of their arm. Bruner appeals to the freeing of attentional resources that occurs as the original action becomes more automatic. These freed resources allow for further task analysis by the child, resulting in higher order actions. I think this is again a good example of the parallels between motor development in an infant and skill acquisition in an adult. As I've discussed many times in the podcast, the shifting of attention from an internal to an external focus seems to be a hallmark of becoming an expert. The final issue Bruner discussed in relation to development is the importance of modeling. That is where we pattern our behavior on another person, like one of our parents. This of course has obvious parallels to the observational learning in sports which they discussed back in episode 20. In the summary of his 1973 article, Bruner again emphasizes the importance of the starting point for motor development provided by our genetics. Quote, The theoretical conclusion to which we must come on the basis of the present discussion is that a great deal of the orderliness in early skilled behavior comes from internal biological sources and is, so to speak, shaped but not constructed by the environment. End quote. I've grown accustomed to the smooth around. Or maybe I'm my dog who's lost his mind. I don't expect to be cheated like a fool no more. I don't expect to see through the night. Some people say it lies, it lies, it lies. I say it why. Why don't I the obvious? Why don't I the obvious child? So, to sum up, in today's episode, I looked at the traditional approach to perceptual motor development. In general, this approach, at least in the early part of its history, was heavily naturistic. Motor development was primarily determined by the physical growth and maturation of the child, passing through distinct and discrete stages or milestones. The initial starting point were a set of pre-programmed behaviors passed down genetically that were grouped into more complex actions through the use of an efference copy. The role of the environment and experience were important, but somewhat minimized in this approach. In extreme cases where a growing animal was completely deprived of experience by being placed in a highly impoverished environment, it could have a major effect on development, but otherwise the role of the environment was mainly to shape or fine-tune pre-adapted behaviors. We also saw a lot of parallels between motor development in children and skill acquisition in general. When I return to the topic of development in a few weeks and discuss the ecological approach to development, we'll hear a very different take on a lot of these ideas. Before I sign off today, I just wanted to mention that I've added a few different ways for you to listen to the podcast. These include using YouTube, note, it's still just audio only, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music if you're an Android user, and if you have an Amazon Echo in your house, try saying, Alexa, play the newest episode of the Perception Action podcast on TuneIn. Also, if you're new to the podcast and are trying to find the older episodes, you can do so at the website, perceptionaction.com, or by installing one of the free apps I created for the podcast. Anyways, you can find all the details about these listening options by going to perceptionaction.com and clicking on how to listen. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now.